possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello and welcome to this week's uh, RTE GAA podcast. Uh, all of the GAA podcasts uh, this week are focusing on uh, the future of women's sport. Our rugby and soccer podcasts uh, are already available wherever you get uh, your podcasts. It's all part of our collaboration with the 20 by 20 campaign. Um, think it, ask it, what's next? Their, their final chapter of that campaign is underway too. So today to discuss uh, football and camogie matters, I'm delighted uh, to be joined by Sinead McNulty, the CEO of the Camogie Association, Rena Buckley, a Cork, a jewel star legend, the most uh, decorated player in Gaelic games, just those 18 Ireland who's chair of the Dublin Ladies Football Club at Kevin Teeley. Uh, folks, you're all welcome and thanks for being with us this, uh, this week. Uh, Shane, I suppose we could start with you first. You, you've been in the job there running the, the Camogie Association uh, for just over a, a year now. Um, where is the sport at in 2020? Obviously, we know the, the COVID challenges that, ha- that have landed on you. Uh, but what's the health, I suppose, of Camogie uh, at the moment as one of the most uh, established uh, women's and girls sports in the country? Yeah, um, thankfully, despite COVID, I suppose from from a membership perspective, we're we're in a very good position. We had a fantastic year in 2019, so we had record attendances. Um, we had almost 25,000 people in Crow Park, which for us is, is a huge jump from a for a standalone fixture. Um, I suppose what has happened over the past year. We had we had made major plans. We had a full staff team in place for the first time in a while, and we launched our new development plan there earlier this year. So we set out a very clear strategy for where we want to be in the next four years. Our membership, despite COVID, our membership has actually uh, maintained, which is is I suppose a tribute to the volunteers across the across the country who have just kept Camogie going despite COVID nineteen. And I suppose that's the that's the the strength of our association where. Around since uh, 1904, first All Ireland final. So, and you know, in, in 2018, we we're recognised as UNESCO sport as well. So, the traditional heritage of the sport um, is is official. It's recognised internationally. And now, I suppose my job is to bring it forward from you know use that that tradition and build on that and build on what everyone has done before, and with the staff team, then just to continue to grow it. It's um, we've had record uh, viewership numbers as well, and in, thanks in no small part to to our work with RT Sport as well. Um, so we were the, the largest in 2019. We were the largest viewed women's sport um, on on television, which was wonderful. And you know, plan was for here to build and um, get people playing the game. And ultimately, you know, any CEO of any sports organisation, that's going to be what they're going to say to you. They want more people playing the game, more people watching the game, um, better recognition, and particularly then as as a women's sport as part of the games family. I'm sure Glenn will refer to this later on. You know, we have unique challenges in terms of what we're what we're trying to achieve. So we're part of a family, but we're all also striving for you know improvement and growth. And with the facilities that are available, that relies on a huge amount of cooperation and collaboration across the family. So it's it's, it's we're, we're in a good place um, despite COVID nineteen. And I just have to keep focusing on the positives. Um, at, at, at that's around I mean, that. We will come back to those uh, the family issues and family relationships a little bit later on, uh, Rena. You've seen it all, of course, along a hugely successful career. What sort of changes and advances have you seen over that time? Playing obviously the same as everyone as a, a young girl in primary school. Um, and I suppose at the time it was the norm that the girls would play with the boys. Um, and girl, girl played on the boys team until they were too old to play on the boys team. And then if you were lucky enough to be from a place that you had a girls team to play on, you progressed onto the girls team. So thankfully I was from a place I was lucky enough I could progress onto the girls team and um, you know I came up along the same the same memory of the first time we get, got to a Camogie all Ireland final I, I kind of felt going into the final it was going to be very much like the you know the men's men's finals you know but unfortunately it kind of wasn't the case in terms of you know support or attendances or media coverage I have to say it's been a huge change and um, I think I think the you know, the attitude towards women in sport, I suppose, has changed hugely in Ireland, particularly in the last, I think, five years or so. Um, media coverage has improved hugely. Sponsorship has improved. Attendances has improved. So we're definitely, definitely going in the, in the right direction um, in terms of the actual sport itself. Um, obviously, your cornerstones of, 
of you know your um, your playing are, are still the same, but the player is certainly supported a little bit better along the way in terms of expertise from strength and conditioning, expertise from a medical point of view, and um, expertise in terms of nutrition. So you know the, for the player as well, there there definitely is improvements, and um, I suppose it's becoming a little bit more professional. But I suppose in terms of comparing it to the men's game, are we a little bit behind? Of course we are. Is that gap decreasing? I think it is. And I think we're definitely going in the right direction. Okay, going in the right direction. Hopefully uh, that certainly is true. Uh, Glenn, if I can bring you in here, you're the chairman of uh, Fox Rock uh, Cabin Teeley, which is a ladies football club. In one of the most successful clubs in the game uh, in recent years. But what's it like at grassroots level for women and girls, as you see it? And I should say, you're a, you're a Welsh man. You're a former Welsh international rugby coach. So you would, you're not from a GA background. No, it's a bit different coming in from a uh, rugby background, coming to Ireland to live 20, 25 years ago. And I got involved because my daughter played. Uh, it's like most people, actually. So we're quite lucky in Fox Cub. We're a little bit of a niche club in the sense that uh, we're ladies only and also a football only club, which is completely different to a lot of other clubs out there. So our needs are very similar to what the other two girls have said, really. Um, we're looking to grow as a club, but how do, the question is, how do we grow? Uh, do we get Camogie in? Do we not get Camogie in? Um, there's a lot of questions to be asked, and a lot of it's around volunteers, and a lot of it's around uh, finance, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose in, in the day-to-day -day, uh, like that, Lindsay, you are open to, to, to opening up and, and taking camogie in. In terms of what sort of challenges would that provide for you? Obviously, in Dublin, spaces well, and access to pitches are, are at a premium. Well, that's the problem we have. Uh, at the moment, we wouldn't be looking to bring in camogie in because, one, we don't have the pitches. Two, we don't have the expertise uh, amongst the volunteers. So it'd be very difficult for us to even even look at it. So at the moment, we stay in very much a football club, uh, a ladies-only football club. I suppose that gives you strength and you, you can focus on, on one game. You don't have to, to juggle like so many clubs do in terms of the, the Camogie in football. Yeah, that's very much so. And I think that's uh, a lot to do with the success we've had, is that um, we concentrate on football, the football skills. So training and playing football twice a week, compared to Camogie, uh, other club who have Camogie, they'd probably split the, split the weeks in half. So there'd be one football, one Camogie, and then there's a the fight then on the weekend, which sport do they play? Yeah, that fight again, we, we will come back to that too. That is a, a issue. Just in, in terms of that and, and growing a club, um, Facility still is, is a big issue, isn't it? Access and, and time on pitches, and obviously you have to coordinate very closely with the GAA clubs. How much of an issue is is that for the game? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose we, we've seen a, a number of new clubs, not only in Ireland, but internally grow over the last um, number of years. So counties where we hadn't club before or a very small numbers, we have new ones. So welcome aboard to Carrick and Shannon and uh, to our new clubs in Mayo and we're working with a couple in Donegal. So uh, Glenn, we, we'd be happy to work with you to provide support and develop that expertise. Um, yeah, the reality is it's a challenge. You know, we, we are facilities from a Camogie perspective. A number of our units have facilities in the country, but we're talking under 10. So, um, you know, we're, we're virtually 99%, nearly more than that, reliant on, the, on our colleagues within the GA and the clubs across um, the country to provide facilities. It's a huge challenge. Um, but I'm really heartened by, you know, I, I had a conversation with uh, Michael Daglin in Offaly, which again would have dual players. Um, and I was heartened by his commitment to being able to work and sit around the table and develop it um, that we can facilitate the growth of both ladies football and camogie and be accommodated within the JA structure. It does work. We have some really good examples around the country where um, fixture schedules are developed to it's not easy. I'm not going to pretend that it's going to be, you know, something you can just set up because even within a club trying to manage its own um, team, my own club, Rent Terror, is trying to manage, you know, access to pitches and stuff. It's very challenging, but it can be done. And with enough commitment and will from everybody around the table, it's possible. So, I, you know, I think that's 
we, we've got to focus on the end game. The end game is getting as many people playing sport, as many women playing sport, and being part of the club structure and being recognised as equal athletes within the club structure, which they are. Um, so I suppose if we focus on the end game, we get over the challenges once everybody is willing to do so. Rina, have you found that being treated as equals within, within the structure and access to facilities and all that? Obviously, you would have had various, uh, I suppose, uh, disappointments and run-ins and, and things down the years in that sense. Um, yeah, look, I suppose it's, a, it's an unusual situation in that, you know, both the Camogie Association and the Ladies Football Association are, are very strong organisations in Ireland. But as they touch on, we don't own their facilities at all, you know. And it's, it's a really unusual scenario where you're reliant on, on, on the GA in terms of accessing, you know, nearly, nearly all facilities in, in, in Ireland. Um, and abroad, obviously. Um, in general, I suppose um, th there, there, has, there, there, there is definitely, um, it's a situation which, which is evolving and, and improving. And I think the sharing of facilities is, is definitely improving as the years are going on. Um, it's, we're not there yet. Um, but I think the concept of putting the girls on the camogie field or on the backfield, I think that, that kind of perception is slowly and um, probably leaving a lot of people hasn't left everyone but it's leaving a lot of people and i think as the country is kind of developing culturally um i think as as younger people are getting involved with a different kind of mindset i think that that perception of equality between men and women and the women on the, on the main pitch of if the women have a final on sunday and the men don't have a final on sunday why can't we put the men on the backfield I think that kind of concept is is creeping into society from from the grassroots roots level all the way up to the you know to the intercounty level and you know our intercounty game should be held in you know top class facilities um, and we should be getting equal treatment you know compared to the men so it's not we're not there yet but much like everything else we are getting there and it's really heartening to see that um at the grassroots level people are getting um, better access to facilities, I would think, from my, my point of view anyway. Um, and at the top level, I think we're getting better access to, to top facilities as well. So we're definitely going in the right direction there too. Because I know in Cork you have a camogie centre, don't you? Um, but we saw recently, say like up in Tyrone, there was a big controversy about the ladies football having to pay quite substantial fees to, to the county board to have centre of excellence in Garak, which seems to be, you know, a, a crazy situation. Yeah, it's 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 quite frustrating because I suppose, um, you know, you look at any any GA setup and you know they go fundraising, they get sponsorship, and both men and women contribute to this this fundraising and the sponsorship, and then it turns out to be a men's only facility, um, and and there's something just quite unjust about that scenario, um, and and I I would really hope that going forward that there would be an understanding between between men and women that these facilities should be shared facilities um, and there should be an understanding that you know the, the Gaelic Games family you know on the ground it's 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 the same people that are involved um, and you know ladies football and camogie should be supporting GA and vice versa that we should be you know in terms of you know funding and be it sponsorship you know at top level be it sponsorship at clubs be it fundraising within the club if it's selling your local your local lotto tickets that we're all contributing, we're all, you know, we're all, you know, working together. And then, you know, our funds get shared out evenly between the different, um, between the different teams, you know, who require a field or facilities at whatever particular time it is. Uh, Glyn, what's your experience in that sense? And I suppose Fox Club kind of stand alone in that you're able to your own funds, but is it still a problem getting what you need and, and getting the, the, the space and access to get all your teams up and running of a, of a weekend? Yeah, we're in a situation where we've got a council-owned pitch. Pitch, we got a senior pitch, a full-size pitch plus a juvenile pitch, um, and it is very difficult, especially having a council-owned pitch. When if we qualify or when we qualify for the uh, the provincial and national tournaments, we have to move to another club because we don't have the facilities, we don't have uh, railings round the pitch. To facilitate the spectators, so we have to move to somewhere like Bray Emmets to uh, play our games, which is very dis uh, disappointing because we're trying to get uh, the community involved, community in to watch the games, but we can't do that because we have to move five six miles down the road to play our games. 
Yeah, it's not but frustrating. We, it's but we are quite thing, like a, a pitch is not available. Yeah, we are quite lucky in the sense where we have control of our own way. And I know that um, a lot of other clubs, the ladies are fighting for their position on the main field. So we don't have that problem as such. You touched on, on, on a problem there of, of expanding the club a little bit earlier, Glyn, just in terms of getting people involved, getting volunteers involved, getting people involved to coach various teams. Is that a challenge for you? Yeah, it is. Because we're quite a young club, uh, I think Foxcar have been involved uh, for 15, 16 years now. And we don't have the expertise of um, the older players coming through yet because our first team, are st uh, ladies now first team are still playing, like uh, Sinead Goldrick and uh, Amy Connolly and these type of girls. Well, we're waiting for them to, you know, it's hard to say, waiting for them to finish so they can put things back into, into the club on a coaching level. Now, they might not do, but that's the hope that the senior team now in a year or two will join the juvenile teams and push them forward and get the uh, drive that they have towards the club. Yeah, you've got some big, uh, big star uh, players there uh, in Fox Cab. Sinead, uh, is that a problem though overall? And I know it's one of the, the 20 uh, by 20 and the, the women in sport uh, <laughs> objectives is to get more uh, women involved in volunteering for the club and being the, the coaches for their teams. Um, is that something that really needs to grow? More female coaches is one of the key things, isn't it? Yeah, it, it definitely is. I mean, I think, you know, Rena is a wonderful role model as a former player in both codes and can inspire people to come on and play. But we need the same. We need, you know, the Angela Downies and and um, and Downies, the people who are still involved and coaching at a high level. But look at that. They've moved from from Kilkenny Kamoki across to Kilkenny Hurling. So, you know, it's uh, that's a wonderful and uh, it's a wonderful achievement for um, a, a female coach who's been involved in Kamoki as a player for so long. But you know, our, our sport needs more and more people like that um, who have, I suppose, who, who have the love of the game and want to instill that into younger players. I suppose for us, getting really good quality coaching at every level is, is a key um, strategic objective for us. It's within our national development plan as part of the developing of the people. So volunteers, whether they're in administration, whether they're in coaching, whether they're in refereeing, they're the cornerstone of how our club structure can grow. So we, we have invested, I suppose, we have a really qualified and a really super staff team who work with our coaches and referees to develop their skill sets, to work, work with coach developers so that we have more and more coaches of a better standard all the time. And right now we're, I suppose, working with colleagues within the GA and Ladies Guild of Football on our player pathways, our coaching pathways or refereeing pathways to I suppose just restructure them have, a, have another look at them make sure that we're doing what we need to do to bring the players along but also bring the coaches along and the referees and you know people all need to feel valued without them none of our clubs would survive we wouldn't have survived the 115 years 16 years that we're here so we, we do need to I suppose acknowledge publicly the contribution the coach make but also acknowledge like the challenges are there um, around coaching the female sport. It, it is slightly different from coaching the male sport. I know I've had, had coaches over the years who much prefer coaching women's team, has haven't coached men's for years because apparently the women do what they want, do what you ask them to do. But uh, uh, they might talk a bit more, but they'll definitely get things done. Um, so I'll call out Tony there if he's watching, he'll remember saying that to me. Um, but you know, it's it, it is it needs to be an attractive proposition for people. And I think what you're seeing now with the increased sponsorship of the game, with the increased uh, media coverage of the game, be that by streaming, by television, or across the various media channels, when it is being talked about, people are seeing that they have an opportunity to be involved in a really high standard of sport, high quality athletes, top performers, elite athletes in the intercounty game, and they're recognised as such by by the government in, in the recent funding. Um, you know that, that are elite intercounty are on a par with the, the elites in other sport. Um, so people people are getting more familiar with that concept of how high quality the sport is. That it is something really good to be involved with. 
in that there is a pathway, a performance pathway for you if you're a coach, if you're a referee or an administrator to work your way up from a club, from underage, through to adult, through to uh, intercounty. And I think that's, you know, that's really important for people because anyone who gets involved in sport, you're competitive and you're ambitious. That's, you know, by the very nature of being involved in sport in any way. So people need to, I suppose, see that there's somewhere for them to fit. The other thing, and again, it's a key with their area development plan is that they know where the association is going and what the association is trying to achieve. So it's not just about one player or one club, but it's about us as a community, us as a part of the Gaelic Games family. Um, but certainly for Camogie, it's about us, where we want to be, what we want to do for our sport and where we believe we can get to. And I think once people can see that and connect to it on a personal level, that, you know, it, it will inspire them to, to get involved when they see that we're really making differences, when we're really changing how we do things. I mean, you know, pivoting all of our training online, our staff had to do huge amounts of work to do that. But it has enabled more and more people to become involved in, tra in training courses, upskilling, education, whether that's refereeing or coaching um, or administrators. So I think that's being responsive and meeting people's needs, listening to what people are saying to us as well. Like the, you know, li listening to our members and doing something about it and saying, yes, we heard you. We heard what you've said, the complaints you've made or the suggestions you've made. We've implemented them. Now we're coming back to you a year later and saying, what do you want us to do now? We've done that. What's next? And always being, you know, progressing and, and you know, being ambitious constantly. The, uh, uh, the football side as well, they do a good job in the sense of putting courses out and uh, getting numbers on courses. But there's uh, another aspect to it of when, when the coaches are left alone, that there needs to be more faces out there to help the coaches come along, um, probably come along to the clubs to help them with sessions, plan the sessions and do little sessions for them. I don't see enough of that being involved in other sports. I don't see enough of that in the football side. I don't know about the Camogie side, especially the football side. Yeah, Rena, access to, to really good coaching is an issue, isn't it, across the board for, for maybe not at the, at the elite level, but certainly for, for girls teams in, in the underage uh, uh, setup, uh, it is an issue. Um, and, and in terms of getting uh, female coaches involved, this is across all different sports, not just Gaelic games. It seems to be a lot of women, a lot of parents are reluctant to get involved. Maybe they, they lack the confidence across the board in sports. They find this, that women haven't the confidence to be coaches. They say, oh, I'm not good enough. I don't know enough about it. They won't sort of step forward in that way. And I suppose just from your experience as well, to pick it up on what Sinead said, girls and boys, do they need to be coached in a different way? And I know you're, you're, you're a physiotherapist. I mean, girls develop differently, both physically and emotionally. Yeah, so I suppose your first point. Um, so I suppose the 20 by 20, I suppose the, the kind of aims were to increase participation, to increase attendance, um, to increase um, involvement, I suppose, in terms of administration and so on, um, and to increase media coverage. I don't have the exact statistics or numbers, but from my own point of view, from my own clubs at home, I think participation levels are, are, are very much equal between boys and girls. I think if you're a young boy or a young girl, no, if you want to play sport, you would play sport. You don't think about, oh, I'm a girl, I shouldn't play sport, or I'm a boy, I should play sport. If you like sport, no, you're just going to play sport. So that's brilliant, and that's a great step forward. I think probably when it comes to the coaching and the administration level, you're probably dealing with a, a cohort of women who a lot of them have not played sport and definitely would suffer from a little bit less confidence than the guy who played until he was even 14. He has that bit of confidence that, let's say, the, girl, the, the female doesn't have. So that's certainly an obstacle that, that, that females are, are encountering. And I suppose, the, um, as both Glenn and Sinead touched on there, it's the support from the governing bodies, from your, in, in terms of Camogie Ladies Football, your county board structures. Um, you know, that's, that's very important for the female who wasn't involved as an underage player, you know, to, to get them up and running and to get them going. Um, I think probably as well, uh, it's, I think it's fair to say that women who have, been, who have played sport probably feel a little bit more pressure from the, the home side of things. They do not put their hands up to, to uh, volunteer in, in the club. That's a major issue. Hopefully that, that's a cultural thing and hopefully that's changing that, you know, it's not just the guy going out playing sport in the evening, but the, 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 the mother in the household, the female is going out as well. Um, and I actually heard Jackie Hurley on the radio recently and I was delighted she, she said on the radio that herself and her husband 
they get in a babysitter on a Wednesday evening or something like that. So the two of them can go out and play their game. And I just thought, isn't that fantastic? And I hope that that type of behavior continues that, you know, that everybody in the house goes out and plays their sport and it's facilitated and supported by everybody else in the house. So I think that's a cultural thing um, that needs to change. I think that's across the board. Um, and hopefully with the supports provided by the, the gov bodies that that will become possible because certainly in any organization, be it in work, in schools, um, and in sport, if you have a gender balance, it's gonna be better for everyone, be it in the boys' sport or in the girls' sport, wherever it is, if you have a gender balance, you know, at, at administration level, at coaching level, then you're gonna end up having a better experience for everybody. So it's really, really important. Um, I can't remember the second question you asked me, no, Claire. <laughs> no, just in terms of the difference between coaching girls and boys, you yeah. know, you'll see it. people will say that they, they need to be coached in, in different ways. They take different approaches to it and they just develop at different rates uh, in terms of both their physical development and their emotional development. Yeah, I suppose. Look, I, I, I suppose I'm not hugely, hugely familiar with the, with the player development pathways. I, I'm, I'm not at that phase of my career yet. We, we'll get there in time. But I suppose, look, in, in, in terms of from an injury point of view, definitely there'd be a different profile in terms of the injuries that a female would, would get compared to a male. But I mean... An under eight girls team versus an under eight boys team, there isn't a whole pile of difference there. An adult girls team versus an adult boys team, you know, I think adult women, you know, look for the same um, type of coaching as adult men, you know, you want that same level of expertise, you want that same, you know, encouragement, you want the same direction, um, you want the same kind of motivation. So I don't think there's a whole pile of difference. There would be small differences, all right, in terms of the injuries that women would, would, would get versus men. There are small differences in terms of the physicality of, of, of both games. But by and large, there's not a whole point of difference. Um, and I suppose what's hugely encouraging is that, you know, and there always has been, but I suppose it's, it, I suppose it becoming just more prominent in, in the media or is it happening more that men are getting involved with women's teams and the feedback has been excellent. It's, you, you know, they find it hugely rewarding and sometimes they're a bit, um, kind of worried about getting involved in men's teams but I've never ever heard a, a male say that you know that their experience with a female team was very different and very disappointing it's usually the, the exact opposite that it was very very rewarding and it was something that they usually enjoyed so again I would hope that you know if, if a male would see an opportunity to train a high level team that they'd regard it as, as training a level male team and um, I think sharing skills sharing ideas and um, and sharing facilities and so on across the board. I think that'll help everybody going forward. Um, and, and I hope to see a lot more of that in, over the, the next couple of years. There's one thing I've found in the last, um, say, 10 years, is that when I got involved initially, uh, girls always need an organized training session before they practice. Now you see a lot more girls on the field practicing individual skills on their own. And that's, that's a big plus for the game and how it's grown over the last 10 years. Uh, Sinead, can we just uh, focus a bit now on the administration of the games? Uh, it's kind of a unique situation, obviously, given that there are three associations that, that, that run Gaelic games in this country, and it is a huge issue in the girls' games that um, particularly, the, the obviously, the, the dual clubs and the girls who want to play both uh, football and camogie. Uh, the communication between the associations, whether they should amalgamate with the GAA and, and fixtures. I mean, we see it year in, year out. The stories we, we saw um, in the last couple of weeks, Ashley Maloney from Tipperary talking about how the, the care team had to pull out of a camogie final, which is, which is uh, scheduled the following morning from a football final. I mean, I'm sure Arena has countless, countless examples. And it is a cause of huge frustration. I know from a, a personal level, I didn't get to play both. I only played, we didn't have a camogie club, we had football, but I have three girls who play both. And I have a 14 year old uh, who just before this lockdown played two championship games, 15 hours apart. Um, you know, this is an age old problem. It's a huge concern of parents on the sidelines. What can be done, Sinead? Well, um, I suppose the first thing is we've, we've made a commitment in our national development plan to, to challenging, the, to, to facing the fixtures challenge because it is there, um, you know, that there is, there's a load of things that feed into it. It is there and it does need to be solved. I suppose what a lot of people don't know, and, and you've 
said it very well there, Claire. Um, people don't necessarily realise that there's three separate associations, first of all. Um, so that presents its own governance challenges. Um, then within every club, there's different structures. So some clubs have uh, what we call a one club model, where the three associations work really closely together. They've one committee and they operate as a single force and they, they figure out the membership bit, you know, in the background. Um, but we also have standalone clubs. So I suppose that, that it's important that people understand that. But when it comes to trying to organise fixtures, the first one, and we've already touched on it, is facilities. So we get access to facilities um, at the behest of, of um, our, our colleagues with, within the GA. So, I mean, it was depending on the structures and their competition structures. We've had situations where, you know, coming up to um, very important games, inter-county games, and Arena can probably attest to it. On the Tuesday before a Saturday or a Sunday fixture, we still haven't confirmed a venue because the county is looking for their club championship and they're waiting to see whether the match will go ahead on a Saturday or Sunday. So that's part of the challenge, you know, that, that the access to facilities, you're, you're waiting on that to happen. At a national level, like we would engage with, with our colleagues in the LGFA. We've been trying to, um, you know, work with them and trying to avoid any clashes where we can. We have certainly moved fixtures in this year's calendar to avoid clashes. Um, this year is a particularly difficult year because we're trying to get uh, three associations full year of activity in championship into a nine week period. So um, it's, it's, it's going to be really difficult. But uh, at a local level, we need people to work together. So at a county, we need the three county boards to sit down at the start of the year and work it through. And it's not a case or, or in an ideal world, it wouldn't be a case where one association sorts out all their fixtures and then comes it may be looking at things differently and altering what way you look at your championship year, what way you look at your, your calendar and try and make sure to minimise the, the impacts on the players. Um, the communication, again, there's because there's different levels, so you have your club, your county, your province and your national. At national, we are talking, we can't solve every single problem. A lot of the stuff has to be done at a more local level. It has to be worked out at provincial and county. And what I'm trying to do is put in place structures that will encourage that to happen. Uh, look at our good practice role models like our Wexfords or Waterfords or Scommons, where people have, where ladies get football and we have sat down and worked through fixture schedules and had the hard conversations with Marley and, you know, worked out a fixture uh, schedule that works for everyone. But as I say, it does require everyone coming to the table and it does require compromise on everybody's part because at the end, I, what we all want is everybody playing our games. Um, I think what we've seen Can in the men's situation games... Where I see in the boys' games that, you know, uh, certainly I know from my own club that, you know, boys play football one weekend, they play hurling the other weekend. Is that impossible to achieve for girls? They never have these clashes. They literally never have them and it's incredibly frustrating. Nothing is impossible, Claire. Um, as I say, what it takes is everybody being willing to compromise around the table, but they have the luxury of having guaranteed access to the facilities that they need at the time they need them to facilitate that. And that's where our challenge is. So that's why we're doing a facilities audit. It's, you know, it's, it's because we need to be able to explain very clearly what we need when we need it and make sure that we're in the mix at the start of the calendar year when fixtures are being developed. And it's not that, you know, we're, we're fitting our games in when it suits, you know, we have to be able to provide our players with a reasonable notice period for, for their games. Um, it's not impossible, but it, it's going to require work. And um, the GA do it because they're one organization and that, you know, they have to do it. They have to make it work, but they do have the facilities to back them up. I suppose a lot of people would ask too, I mean, what is your communication like? We, we did ask somebody from a ladies football association, they just weren't available today to join us, unfortunately. But what is your communication like with uh, your sister association and do you see a time a lot of people will casually say why can't they all get together why can't they all be one <laughs> is that possible is that likely uh, again anything's possible um but i suppose the reality you know we've 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 come from a very different place so you know the ga 1884 we're 1904 and ladies gaelic football um the 80s i'm not exactly sure what year glenn might be able to help me out there Before, but um i suppose we've come from a different place so like Pardon me? 1974, I think, is the year. Um, oh, good. Thanks, Rena. <laughs> um, so I suppose uh, in some ways, Ladies Gaelic football has been able to set, it, set itself up 
from the start in a way that it wanted to. For for us, we've been 115 years growing as an association, developing from as you know, we're becoming a much more professionalized organization with our professional staff team. Um, so we've come from different places. Uh, we do like we share a building, so we're we're on the second floor and Lady Gale Football on the first floor. So we would regularly have uh, cups of coffee, cups of tea. We meet regularly um, at different levels. So you know, I'd I'd have regular phone calls with Helen. Um, from the Lady Gale Football Association and across the staff team there'd be regular engagement so their communication is really good um, but there are, there are always going to be challenges um, so you know that's I suppose be, being honest if, if you're in an ideal world would you start here no but this is where we are and um, so we're, we're going to bring together like a, a lot of the things we're doing now are about aligning the association so things like aligning our membership dates because again I know my own club was how come Lady Gale Football and Camogie are in a different membership date than uh, uh, GA, can we not just get it all done at one time? How come the rates are different? So what we're really working on at the minute is rule changes that will enable that kind of alignment. So we have our Congress coming up on the 10th of October, and um, we have a rule change going in, uh, being proposed around changing the date to align it with the GA. We're working at a coaching and a refereeing uh, development level and also an administration and leadership development level together as three associations. So what people would have seen in 2020, which they hadn't seen before, was a joined up, united, one set of training sessions for our leaders and our volunteers, one set of uh, foundation coaching materials across the three associations. Anyone who develops, who does foundation coaching now is trained to teach the three codes. And that is a huge development. And I think that's a sign of where we're going and what the intention is. We work really closely together. There's a lot of tradition to work through. There's a lot of governance issues that obviously we'd have to work through, but we are working really closely together where it matters, which is for the for the players and, and the develop, you know, the development of, of um, our volunteers. And we'll keep working on the other challenges as I say we've committed to working on the fixtures one, but we're we, we're at the table and we're asking questions and we're putting ourselves out there and as I say we have made changes to this year's schedule already on the back of trying to avoid clashes so we'll continue to do that we want all yeah, players Rina, to play um, our game. You've obviously been, been long involved in, in both camps would you like to see them come together and come under the one one family one uh, GAA because a lot of the time it just seems like that the players on the ground are the ones that suffer uh, all the time and are being left out in this. Yeah I suppose look the first point I'd make on this is that Look, 2020 has been a, um, a very unusual year for, for all sports. But like the big, I, I would say the biggest issue that, you, that all of the Gaelic Games family have is the fixtures. So I would hope that we will have a huge learning process from 2020 and that our calendars across all three codes are going to change hugely um, going forward from 2021 on. So that would be the very first point I'd make. Um, the next point I'd make is there is definitely um, the, the one club um, idea has been you know taken on board by some clubs across the country and I think that is excellent because on the ground you're dealing with the same families you know in your community and definitely we need to work together at, at club level. I think the one club idea is excellent. I think it needs to be brought forward to, to one county, one province and I do think at, at, the, at the top level as well. I think across the three, um, three associations we definitely need to work together. We need to share our facilities we need to share our fixture list and we need to keep player welfare, you know, to the forefront. And um, it is, you know, it, it's, it's not good enough to have players playing two championship games over the one weekend. It's, it's, it's not right on the players. It's not right for the clubs. It's, it's, it's not good going forward. So I think, you know, there needs to be um, collaboration at all levels within the Gaelic Games family. Um, no, on the other side, you know, I look at, at other sports who are, all at the, in the one, you know, female and female, and there's still discrepancy between the male and female. So everybody coming together is not the answer to, to solve all problems. We definitely need to, to work together at all levels. And I think fixtures is a huge issue and it needs to re be resolved. And 2020 can be, you know, I think that can be the tipping point in terms of fixtures. And I would hope that in 2021, that all fixtures, men's, women's, and particularly that the women will work together and we'll get a good fixture plan, you know, to allow people at all levels to enjoy the sport and, you know, to be able to play. I suppose I've been an intercounty, I was an intercounty player for 14 years. Um, and I understand that, you know, the role of inter at, at, at a dual intercounty player has changed hugely over that time. 
I know that is becoming definitely difficult. I, I, I understand that. Is, is it a thing of the past, Rina? I mean, the Cork women did it so well down the years. But I mean, is it even at club level? I mean, we see it inter-county level. It's incredibly difficult. But now even at, at teenage kids level, is it impossible, going to become much more difficult to be a dual player because of all of these clashes? Yeah, look, certainly at inter-county level, it's becoming much more difficult. I suppose championships have changed in terms of their format. And there's more demands on the player, you know, it's become more professional. So, you know, when I started playing, there was no such thing as, um, you know, there was no gym programs or anything like that. Whereas that's become part and parcel of the game. But certainly at club level, a, you know, a dual player is, is very much, you know, um, still on the cards. It can very much be facilitated. And I think culturally, it's the responsibility of associations to facilitate the player to play both football and camogie if that is their wish. Uh, Glyn, just from your point of view as a club chairman, would you like to see um, the associations uh, come together just to come to be under that broad, big uh, GAA family? Would that make uh, life a lot easier for you and, and there would be advantages to that? Um, we're in a different situation because we're football only. So the, the problems that we have is that it's a continuity from week in, week out. Say, for example, um, if you're swapping weekends, our, our our, because we're football only, we go have to go on five matches or whatever. So there's no organised matches. So there's a week off, and once there is a week off, players we don't actually fight with Kamogi. We more our competition really is hockey, especially in Southside Dublin, where hockey is very strong. All the schools are very strong in hockey, and they sell the schools through the hockey. So we we're not fighting Kamogi. We're fighting the hockey. So we have to work with the, with the hockey players and the hockey clubs to get, get the players. So, but yeah, it would be an organisation, or I think there should be two seasons. Uh, the split season of uh, league and championship, I think it should be enjoyed. how we would work it. I don't know. Everybody knows exactly where they are from Saturday to Saturday. Uh, and where they are, so it would be my look on it. But that's from an outsider looking in. So, and Sinead, do you see a day, I suppose, when um, the associations might all come together under the one umbrella that the that they would all merge into the GAA? Is that something you see? Something you would want? The sports world or the sports um, environment in in Ireland, the the golfing unions were wants to come together last year for the union. So I suppose, you know, internationally it is where things are going. There's a lot less um, stand on male or female organisations. For me, I came into the role, we have a, a, a memorandum of understanding signed with the GA, and we've been three years into that process. And as I say, we're seeing the proceeds out of that now, you know, for, at, at a membership level. I think it's possible. Um, it's certainly there's a commitment there to working more closely together to integrating more closely would it become one organization um i don't think it would be fair for me to make that statement on behalf of any of the other two organizations i think we can certainly work together more effectively more closely and in a more integrated and coherent way um and and we are working towards that um the 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 bigger question is you know it's a political question as much as anything else there's so much history to bring in you've three really big really different environments so um but definitely two is working together whether um there be you know a merger down the line listen it's uh who knows who knows um yeah it's it's like right for me to say it you know and, and just like to make the point that, you know, if all the three associations came together, you know, it would benefit each of the associations, not just the women's section. And definitely the women need to work together with each other more, but like it would be beneficial for all three associations. And I suppose the GA have a slogan at the moment, GA everyone belongs. And I would love to see everyone belonging to a Gaelic Games family situation. And it, would, it would be fantastic for, for everybody involved in, GA, in, in Gaelic Games. You know, you'd be looking at, you know, shared expertise across the board you will be looking at men and women involved you know and, and it leads to better organization and it would be something fantastic and something that i think we could all be really really proud of and and um, i i think it's it's the future for us to be honest and just to wrap I mean, up it's uh, happening you know, already you know yeah just just to wrap up folks because we are we are running out of time just i suppose to to, to look forward uh, we've talked a lot about where you've come from where we are 
what are your hopes uh, going forward, Reen? I was talking to Lena, Leona Maguire recently. She's also a 2020 ambassador and she was saying, you know, that really one of the things is, uh, you know, and the campaign has been fantastic and it has risen the visibility, but that, you know, women's sport shouldn't settle it. This sort of, she felt that there was a thing that we, uh, we were almost, uh, the women's sports were, you know, settling for the scraps and that really we shouldn't be afraid to ask for more and to push for more. You know, the door is, is open and it, it really needs to be, to take advantage of this time and this moment. Yeah, look, I suppose when the 2020 campaign got going, I suppose one thing that they were looking for was that they were looking for um, kind of um, uh, a shift in terms of the perception of women in sport. Um, and you were, we were looking for Ireland to culturally base women and girls in sport. And um, I suppose they set objective measures in terms of an increase in 20%. And I suppose the next question is to get greedier than that, to look for equality, to look for much more than the 20%. And I suppose to look for that, that unconscious bias, you know, to be eradicated and for sport to be celebrated. So whoever is playing sport, you know, sport is good. Sport leads to more inclusive society. It leads to more healthy society. So sport, you know, if we all play, you know, we have a better society. So whoever it is playing sport, be it boys, girls, men, women, that that is seen as something good, something positive, you know, something strong and something worth celebrating. And going forward, I would hope that everybody gets on board with that and that we create, you know, a better culture, a better Ireland, you know, and we have equality across participation, across attendance, um, across sponsorship and across media coverage. And I think it would be just, I think it would be better for all of society and it would lead to, you know, a better Ireland that we all would like to be part of. Yeah, absolutely. It certainly would. Uh, Glyn, what would be your, your hopes for, for 2020 and beyond as someone who, who runs a club uh, for girls and women? Uh, very similar. You know, more publicity we get, the better it is for everybody because the sponsors will come in, the media will want to get out, the more media we can get, all sorts of media, uh, the better it is for everyone. So that, that would be the big thing is that uh, it, it does become equal, especially uh, the press, uh, the television. I know it's improved, but it can be improved again. Once it becomes equal, the money will become equal. And that's probably where it is. It's a big circle that you get the publicity, you get the money through sponsorship and you get the crowds. Uh, yeah, Sinead, uh, to wrap up with you just as well. Yeah, just on that, I mean, obviously we've seen huge strides and you talk about record days and the record attendances in Croke Park, which make the headlines and that that is fantastic for the game and it's great for the game. But I suppose on, uh, you know, growing outside of that, we see other championship and league games where maybe, you know, they certainly do not get that attention and they do not get uh, those attendances. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it, the, the big day is really important, but for our associations, all of the days are important. So every every time we can achieve um, greater numbers attending our games, I suppose it gives a, a boost to the players on the pitch. First of all, it gives huge enjoyment to the people who are actually watching the games. And we could see that when we, when we were restricted and couldn't watch games. So there is enjoyment to, to be had. Um, but it is more about supporting our, supporting our players, supporting our clubs, counties and associations, that it's not just about the big day. The big day is great. But what we really need to be doing is building throughout the year, getting more people going down to see their club under 14 game, getting people out to watch Vela, getting people out to watch the, the counties as much as the, the big day. I mean, we, we talked last year about if all of our members came to our All Ireland, we'd fill out Crow Park. Why isn't that happening in September? Why why isn't it happening? This year is a different different kettle of fish. But if you know, really to call out to our members to support our players, our clubs, and our associations, they there's just um, I suppose it's about call, again calling it out that people need to. Um, uh, they might go out in a local. I suppose friends down the country. We would often go to a men's game. But how often would they go to the ladies games? Not so often. So it's about just getting rid of that. The ladies games are just as important. They're just as tactical, as skillful, as quick and entertaining. So get people out, watch the games, bring your friends to watch the games. And that will by, you know, it will make us equal. And we shouldn't have to be talking about equality for sport or equality for recognition in 10 years. It should be just sport. So really I'd encourage anyone, you know, get do get out of the house, enjoy the fresh air and come and watch a camogie game or a ladies get a football game. Um, you know, get out and support your women's sports in the way we would have supported 
the men's because it supports your clubs in ways that you don't see. Um, I think that's the, the important bit. And it's sometimes it's too easy to stay on the couch when it's a little bit chilly outside. So yeah, copy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you need to get out there, put your money where your mouth is, stand on the sidelines uh, and get out there and, and support the games. Obviously when uh, these COVID times hopefully will leave us soon. Well, listen, uh, folks, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you, to Sinead, to Rena, and uh, to Glynn. And uh, do remember that uh, also our rugby and soccer podcasts uh, this week also uh, discussing the, the wing it, women's games. They're also uh, available now. But uh, thanks for joining us, folks, and uh, thanks for listening. Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. Well, what I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! He hits it! <laughs>